was born. America has been looting black people since we were stolen and brought here on slave ships 400 plus years ago. We learned violence from America. There's nothing that America has accomplished without violence. And so if you want our people to back down, and we have those conversations every night. Don't put it on us. Don't ask black organizers to go out in the streets and try to calm down angry people. Don't ask black organizers to go and deal with the people that you are paying to infiltrate our movements. We see you. You ain't low. We see you. We know when your people show up and they throwing bricks so you can change the story on the 11 o'clock news. Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome to the Good Hombres Report. My name is The Day Day. I am your host. I'm here today in Washington Square Park in New York City, Manhattan. And uh, yeah, we're going to walk around and ask the protesters some questions about what they feel needs to be done in order for the protests to stop. And so let's go and check it out. For me, it's not making a list of demands. It is about an open dialogue and you have to be willing to listen and ready to actually take in what is being said. Most people have a problem with hearing that. I find that with some people, if I make any comments about the way that someone is acting that is not black and that person will immediately feel like I'm talking about them. Every person that is out here protesting that is not a black person, they need to take all this information and need to actually speak up because People are here, yes, and they are holding up signs and they're standing with you and they're supporting you, but what are you doing in behind closed doors? What are you doing when you're that only person that actually believes in black lives, you know, and everyone else around you is just fixated on the rioting and the, and the violence and the looting. How do you feel about the looting in regards to how, how it's affecting everything? Because I know a lot of people on the other aisle, like I said, they feel that it's actually detracting away from the movement itself. Um, to a certain extent, it does uh, detract, but that's only in regards of the naysayers and the people that do not want to see or address the root cause of it, making it detract from it. Um, let's be honest, this is America. They've looted from everybody. That's literally what colonialism is. You choose to make the focal point about the riots and the looting. No one is condoning it. You know, we're not, I'm not, I'm not standing up and saying, oh, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I know people who, whose stores have been, you know, vandalized and, you know, I understand people are out of work. People are losing property. They have insurance and it will be replaced. But no, I'm not saying that's okay. No one is in support of that. People need to understand the difference between a, a looter and an actual protester. There are people that take advantage of the situation. It's not everybody. If you choose to make that the focal point, then you'd have missed the point and you're the problem. And to say that, oh, you know, this is, um, this is very unfortunate, this rioting should stop, you know, the looting doesn't help anyone. However, you know, I, I understand why this is happening. And that's, I think that's the part that's being missed when someone makes these statements about rioting and looting. They're not expressing that they understand what caused it, but don't fixate on the, in fact, fixate on the cause. You can totally condemn the bad actions of a few people, but do not make that the whole cause. Well, well spoken. Thank, thank you very much for your time. By the way, I didn't get your name. I'm Princess. Okay, so this is Princess. She's one of the protesters here in the march. And so, uh, yeah, thank you for talking to me. Thank you. I'm a public servant. I'm an elected official. And as an elected official, I know who put me in office. And as an elected official, you must be accessible and accountable to the people who put you in office. You can't just show up when it's election time. You can't just be cooning and shucking and jiving to get votes. But when you get in office, you have the responsibility of using your office as a platform for change. So the change we need from our elected is we need legislation to repeal 50A. 50A needs to be repealed. I worked for the New York State Unified Court System, and every day when I went into court, I ran the drug court. And
came before the judge. But see, 50A hides the rap sheets of the police. So we need the rap sheets of the police to be revealed so that they can be held accountable, so that they can be prosecuted, and so that they can be convicted. Power to the people. No justice, no peace. Uh, what was your name, sir? Uh, my name is Gilbert. Gilbert, hey Gilbert. Um, my name is The Day Day. It's my YouTube channel, The and Day Day. And so I'm here today at the protest. And so you mentioned you wanted to, you were looking uh, to say two things, two important things. Well, there's something to be said for, you know, racism isn't just, it's not just lynching, it's not just violence, it's not just, um, you know, it's not just the extreme portions of what you see here. Racism is taught. It's not necessarily that, it, it's, not, it's not as though it's like an unfixable condition. Like, people can learn racism just like they can unlearn racism, or actually better. No one is born a racist, is what exactly. they say. Like, you know, kids don't learn that kind of stuff. It starts at home also means that they can do a lot to teach their kids not to be racist, to include other brown, other, other brown, other black people in their lives. It all starts with exposure. So that's first. The second, um, you know, just being a professional of any kind, Corporate structures in this country do have terrible hiring practices, especially for things like law, especially for things like finance, and especially for things like media. And so the perspective that we have, everything is made with only white people in it, and only they only get to see the diversity of white people as characters, like you know, in like the global, in, like in their spectrums. But we don't have any representation other than what we see on screen. We're always portrayed as criminals. We're always portrayed as poor. We're always portrayed as addicts. We're always portrayed as lesser than beings that need some kind of help. When really there are millions of us who are educated, who are, you know, who are talented in other areas other than entertainment and sports, who can make real contributions. Yet we are overlooked and we are ignored and we are turned away because of the color of our skin, because of our backgrounds. That has been going on here forever. And so changing the way that we include people in not just our corporations, the way we like on the boards of executive committees, the way, you know, in, in, in academics, you know, um, um, in advertising companies, literally everywhere. The fact that we don't have any representation makes a difference and makes an impact in how we are also treated in society. Everything from nonfiction to fiction, we don't receive the same treatment that white people get to be whatever they want. Whether it's on screen or off, they can be anything that they want and we don't get to be because we are never given the chance and nobody ever wants to give us the chance to represent ourselves in a light other than the way that they want us to be portrayed. It takes, it takes so much more effort for us to even have any kind of real equality or a seat at the table in the institutions where it matters most. Everything from corporate America to everything to our legal system. We are not there. I think that there's work to be done on both sides. I think that really the conversation that needs to be had, especially in a lot of white communities is what can we do to make way and to just bring in more people who might be different than we are? What can we do to not replicate the same things that we've already been perpetuating? And that's a hard conversation to have. I'm not saying that it isn't. I, th I think that it's a very difficult conversation for people to have because they've never had to really look inside their own, they've never had to do any introspective reflection because it doesn't apply to them because they don't have to think about it because they've been trained never to think about it. For those of us who get through, you know, we work on trying to make this a more equal playing field, but this isn't gonna happen in a manner that is fast, quite frankly, or any kind of real change unless white people are really looking to look within themselves and just have an honest conversation. And by the way, this is not an attack. You know, this is a conversation that you need to have. You know, there are a lot of people who would look at what I'm saying is, and saying and they would go, oh, well, you know, that's not me. Oh, well, you know, like, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. This isn't about you as an individual. This is about you and your group, what you can contribute as a group. You know, this isn't about what you're doing as individuals. This is about you as a group and pointing out where these holes are. You ever notice that whenever black or brown people, you know, are upset, it's always looting and rioting. And whenever white people are upset, it's always like a revolution and a rebellion. So, you know, for me, the language actually matters because there are, plenty of, there are plenty of white people who were fighting for change and broke a ton of things, burned a ton of things, killed a ton of people. 
As far as looting and rioting, look, I'm not for breaking anything. I don't like the fact that, like, you know, that things are burning around, you know, me and everything. Like, you know, we know people who own small businesses to whom this should not happen. However, I am not going to pretend like we don't need to get people's attention about this. You know, I am not a looter and a rioter. I'm not supporting the burning down of buildings, but I am also not going to say that the people are not justified in the way that they feel. You know, there are plenty of so-called revolutions and rebellions for, by the, for stuff, by the way, that is not as important as the fact that we are being brutalized and murdered by the police. You know, people turn over cars for football games. People burn down buildings because they lose at hockey. Okay? Yeah, fair point. I mean, what are we talking about? You know, a couple of buildings like, you know, got burned down and looted for something that is actually a human problem. You know, you guys lost a football game. I mean, I've seen, st I mean, I've seen riots over sports games like all the time. I will not stand by. I will not be silent. I will not let my pain and my anger paralyze me. And so in the spirit of my elders who have paved the way for me, in the spirit of my son who is black and Mexican and indigenous, in the spirit of my unborn son because I am six months pregnant standing here in front of you. And in the spirit of in la quesh, which means you are my other me. I will not stop fighting. I will not stop organizing. I will not give up. My fight is your fight. I will stand beside you. I will stand in front of you when you ask me to shield you from the violence, taking your lead every step of the way because I believe that once black people are free, my people will be free. In this country, historically, the same systems that are weaponized against black people have subsequently been yielded against us Latinos. All right, hey, can I just get your name real quick before we start? Sure, Sandra. Sandra, hey, how's it going today? Good, pretty good. Okay, so the question, I'm here today to ask people questions, and the main question I want to ask you is, what do you think can be done to stop all of this? What needs to happen? A lot. It's systemic racism that's gone back um, in our history, and I think we need to start somewhere and come together and look at things like police reform, but it needs to go further than that beyond the police brutality. It has to look at our whole system of how we treat the black community, uh, socioeconomic issues. As a healthcare provider, we see the black community affected more than any other community by certain types of medical issues. And we need to take a look at that and assess it the way we would as a healthcare provider and really look at it scientifically. I'm a healthcare provider. I'm not a politician. I'm not an economist. I do think these changes are the right path though. We need to take a look at the money and the funding if they're not giving us the outcome that they're promising, we need to take a look, just like healthcare. They look at a problem and they say, you're not fixing it. Why are we giving so much money to you if you're not fixing the issue the way we discussed? And it's the same thing. If we're giving all this money, but we're not getting the outcome we want, and we have, we're experiencing police brutality and, and an unfairness to the black community, we need to stop that funding. We need to take a look at how we're allocating that and say, hey, if you're not giving us what you promise, then we need to take a look at the money and reassess where that money should go to actually make the changes of the promises of the outcomes that we actually wanted. But the problem is you get, we get complacent when there isn't a lot of violence or a big event to make people aware of it. But I, I, you know, the whole problem of this is like, we gotta have hope and we gotta keep fighting even when things seem to be working out our way. And the best thing we can do is vote and hold people accountable. Healthcare providers are held accountable all the time for the decisions we make every single day in the line of duty. Cops should be held accountable every single day, just like we are. We gotta stop protecting people that make mistakes and we have to change the line of thinking to say, you made a mistake. Not only do we say, hey, you gotta pay for it, but it's like, how do we fix it so this mistake doesn't happen again? Because that's how we look at it in medicine, right? So when you look at something like George Floyd, you say, what went wrong? Why did that happen? And how do we prevent that from ever happening again? That's how we have to look at things from now on. And the perfect thing is I got into a debate with someone and they said to me, as a healthcare provider, if someone with the same title and job responsibility as you did something like this in another state, would you feel comfortable with everyone protesting against you because you just happen to be affiliated? And I said, yes, because I would condemn that practitioner. As a, as a group, we would come together and condemn a murdering racist person who stands with our license. We would say no. 
That's yeah, we, we, we report here. people in the medical field. Exactly. That's what we do. There's accountability there, There's accountability. and we would not want to be affiliated with that person. There isn't the secret silence fraternity thing where we don't report. And I'm sure there are people who want to do the right thing and they're conflicted by it. But then what makes you, what makes the difference in this world now is are you going to be someone who stands by and watches it? Or are you going to help be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem, which is the silence of like protecting each other? It has to come out. It, there, there has to be a little punitive aspect, but then the whole mentality has to change that we don't want punity. We want things to get better. We want to help each other. It's to protect and to serve, right? The, their philosophy is totally wrong. In healthcare, we put ourselves at great risk to take care of people, at risk to ourselves during COVID especially. We understand that their job is not easy. We understand that there's risk associated with their job. But there still has to be this philosophy that they're there to take care of these people. And that's what we have. That's what, that's what medical professionals do. We're at risk. Sometimes people aren't very nice to us. But guess what? We still have to take care of them. We still have to treat them with dignity and fairness. And you know we're not going to get away with murdering someone like that. That's just unbelievable to me as a profession even. If we want to see a difference, if we want to continue to lead the change, we need to show up, not just today, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's mainstream, not just when it's popular. We need to show up every single day. All right, I am here with? My name is Nicole. Nicole, okay, Nicole. So the question I'm about to ask you is basically, um, what are your thoughts on what, what needs to happen, what needs to be done in order for these protests to end? Um, I really believe that in order for any of this to end or for the public to find any rest, we need our lawmakers to move immediately on pressing charges on all cops. Um, there's so much video evidence all over the country. They need to press charges on all of the cops who we have video proof of police brutality and crimes and assaults in the city and the entire country. Those cops need to be pr prosecuted immediately. And we need lawmakers to move on laws quickly, to defund the police, demilitarize the police. We need reform in police training. You know, we can borrow from other countries. There are other countries that have excellent police training, that have like zero incidents of police brutality for years. We need to be uh, learning from them. What are they doing to train their police so well that they don't have these kind of problems? <sighs> you know, it's, it's anger. People are angry. Um, is looting cool? You know, do people suffer when looting happens? Yeah. But at the same time, the conditions that led to this anger, it is what it is. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, there's when there's so much anger and there's so much oppressed voices, people will do what they need to do to be heard. And unfortunately, there is the collateral damage that comes from looting. I think looting when it comes to like corporations and stuff like that is that's, you know, a big fuck you to capitalism and the whole valuing, uh, you know, product and uh, money over the value of human lives. Fuck all of that. Uh, I don't, rooting, I mean, looting and rioting in corporations, I fully support, honestly. But uh, there have been some small businesses that got hit by it, which is unfortunate. But again, it's just so much anger that the people have and oppressed uh, voices that you know, for years. So people are doing what they need to do to be heard. And, you know, the media, they cover looting and rioting. But when there are peaceful protests, there was a beautiful protest in Harlem uh, about two days ago. Um, it was the dress your best protest. And you had everyone like dressed in their best tuxedo suits, everything it was beautiful. It was peaceful. It got zero to nothing of media coverage. Honestly, um, I'm a big believer in education, particularly educating people on um, world history and history in general. Um, I remember growing up, I always had a passion for history and racism was never was never really a thing for me because I had such a passion for world history and other cultures and other civilizations that always kind of just, you know, blurred racism to me. I just saw, you know, every race has had so much rich history and power and culture and that, that really has always, I racism never made sense to me because of those things. I always really, appreciated other cultures because I had the opportunity to learn about them. And I think that's really, really important. Education reform. Um, education reform. We have such a deep problem with education in the United States. And it is very regional, which is also unfortunate. It is our duty to fight for our freedom!
My name is Jamie Reynoso. Jamie, the, the question I have for today basically is, what do you think, just give me your thoughts on what can be done to finally put a rest to these riots, the protests? Well, I think our police officers need to be trained to disregard their biases against uh, people of color and minorities, as well as establishing a community review board on, in every borough, in every city, and in every, and if the town is small enough, than in every county in America. Um, do you support something like defunding the police? Um, no, because the police still perform a crucial function in society. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you know, but in the early 90s and the 80s, and the 70s and the 60s, New York City was a very dangerous place. Uh, and, a, and in a way, what has improved the livelihood of people in New York City is the police presence. There are good cops and there are bad cops, and the people who are bad cops should be held accountable for their actions. They shouldn't use their positions to push their agenda. I do not believe in defunding the police. We believe in equality and fair treatment for ourselves. You know, the movement might go dormant. The protests might stop next week, you know, but we will protest again next month, next year, in the next decade, and for the next century. How, so how do you feel about the, uh, so you differentiate? Until that happens. So do you, do you differentiate between the looting and the, and the protesting? Of course, the looting is a small percentage of the protesting, you know? And it's people taking out their aggressions, but a large part of the looting is also um, young men who have misguided ways of dealing with their frustrations. Uh, us as a community, we're dealing with the looting the police are dealing with the looting. You know, everyone's dealing with the looting in the best way they can. We discourage people from doing it. But at the same time, it is a very small percentage of all the peaceful protesting that has been going on. Today, we peacefully protested for six hours. Last week, we went to Newark, New Jersey, and we peacefully protested all day. Tomorrow, we're going to peacefully protest again because we don't want our message mixed with a message of violence. We are nonviolent minorities who believe in equal, treat, in equal rights for ourselves. So I wanted to end it with this. You stated that we're going to protest until, until forever. So are you of the opinion that essentially America no, will never... No, not until forever. We're just going to protest it until we feel like the police don't harass us in our communities. You know, that's, that's... We're going to protest until that happens. Not forever, but, you know, until that happens, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next year, it could happen in the next decade we will never stop, you know, because you might kill some of us, you're definitely going to harass some of us, but you can't kill an idea. This is embedded in our DNA, you know. <laughs> under, what, uh, under what stipulations would you say that we can, we can say, is there a, an objective thing that we can look at that you would say, okay, this problem has been solved? Well, I think you can look at incarceration rates. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very broad spectrum of things you can look at. Um, you can look at the percentage of people that get killed by uh, police officers. You know, the reality of the matter, there are times where the police officers are going to have to use lethal force. Um, but it can't, you know, we represent 13% of the population, and yet we're 33% of the people who get murdered by police. And that's just in the extreme case of getting murdered. In the case of harassment, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but I do feel like they disproportionately attack us. Um, and, you know, once those numbers reflect something different, then we could talk about stopping, pro uh, stopping the protesting. Uh, you know, then we could talk about the end of the disruption of normal life. My brothers and sisters, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience but in times of challenge and controversy. Anybody can stand with you when things are going well, but who's gonna stand with you when blood is pouring down our streets of black men and women brutalized, killed, destroyed, and murdered by the police? Hi, Will Mallon, my friend Mo. Mohan. Uh, we both live and work here in New York. So I think we need to change the whole view of how this, what this is. This is not a protest. This is a rally. We need to be a movement. We need to have an end game. Occupy Wall Street, all these things, they failed because they were protests. 
they didn't have a goal. This, there's got to be people in there who want to run for something. The way to change things is to put new people in power. We have that power to do it by the virtue of our government. So let's do it. We have these things we believe in. Cops should not kill people in the street. Basic principle, number one. This whole rally right here is just don't kill people in the street. That's it, P period. There needs to be a national police reform where they're all retrained so to just don't will, kill people. Will, will, what Will is trying to say is that young people need to become more active, more engaged in actual local politics. Yeah, and if you're not, it, well, and so ultimately change is only begot by local politics. If you are not going to run for local politics and all of your viewpoint is, you know, the presidency is the, the end all be all of what change is, yeah. you're going to fail. Let's find some new the people young year. people have to say, you know what? I'm going to run for city council. I'm going to run for, you know, uh, a, a state senate seat. I'm going to run for state senator, say, you know, state representative. That's what young people need to do. And if you don't engage in local activism, you will ultimately fail and you will never achieve your goal. Yeah. So what, what do you guys think is, is, so what do you guys think is the end game here? How, what, what do you hope will happen? I just hope that, like I said, we have an election coming up in November. We have YouTube, we have right. Facebook, we have all the these like modern yeah, The election of the presidency doesn't matter. It matters what's gonna happen on the local level. Are you going to vote for the next city council member? Like, are what, you gonna vote what? in your next local election? If you're not gonna vote for your next local election, then kiss all of this goodbye. This was all for naught. Right, I mean, the basic thing is, what are our political goals with this whole protest? Like, obviously, we don't want a George Floyd to ever happen again. That should be the basis of the movement. Like, this should not be a protest. This is a rally. We need to get people elected. And you can write people in on the ballot. Like, it's, it's, it's way less complex, I think, than people think it is. So there is an interesting perspective on the looting, right? And the perspective is there, people have been suppressed. African Americans have been suppressed for 400 years in this country. And if you think about it, and this is not these are not my words; these are the words from somebody else. I forget the the lady's you know eloquent name, but if you think about it as a game of Monopoly, you are playing a rigged game of Monopoly. And so, for 400 years, every time your piece moved around the board, it didn't matter what piece you landed on; you paid rent. And even if you worked hard, the money that you made, you gave to somebody else because you were creating wealth for somebody else. And only in 1967 did people of color really get equality under the law, right? And so now for 50 years, you are, all, right, and you are still ultimately relying on people for 50 years to say, well, hey, catch up, guys. What's going on? Why aren't you at the same level? But now, if you think about a game of Monopoly, when, these black, when, when, when African Americans and people of color try to move around the board after the last 50 years, white people have just said, you know what, fuck this game. And they've tossed the board up. Yeah. And they've said, sorry, we're not playing anymore. New rules. And so we're gonna recreate the rules of this game. How do you ultimately win in a game where the, the power structure is stacked against you? The, the rules constantly change. You can't win in a game that, you, you can't win in a game where you can't make the rules. And the rules will always change if you try to fight back. And so how do you ultimately recreate wealth for yourself? If for 400 years your ancestors have been enslaved and the wealth that they have created never went to those people and went to the people that owned human beings, the only way to take that wealth back is to say, Sorry, Louis Vuitton. Sorry, Hermes. Sorry, you know, Salvatore Ferragama. I'm taking your shit because those people can never actually attain that wealth by legal means today. It's a rigged game. And yeah. so if you have a rigged game, you cannot expect people to play by their rules. You have to ask the people in power, do you want us to burn it the fuck down Right? Do you want to give us equality or do you want African Americans to take revenge? Right? And that's the question that people really need to ask themselves. Do they take revenge or do they demand equality? And ultimately I think that we're at a breaking point where 
people are going to say, we're going to take revenge. And I think lo looting is a symbol of revenge. Now, do I also think that there are cer certain people that are going to take advantage of it? Absolutely. Yeah. But if you're ne if you're never going to give people a chance I to mean, rise, and every time they take one step forward, you push them two steps back, well, at some point, you're going to have something like this happen where people are gonna say, you know what? Now is my time for revenge. And if you've had a sim if you've had a, a system of 400 years of repression, and now all of a sudden you're gonna have 50 years of, you know, equality, when it's really not equality, well, people are gonna rise up at some point. The one thing, I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys have seen this, but what I've seen on the news, it seems like there's a heavy police presence like in areas like where stuff like this is going on, like a you know, rally, protest, whatever you want. But then in areas where there's people robbing stores and, and going gung-ho crazy, where are the cops? You know, it's like the cops are not, they could go there very easily and stop it. And in some instances they do. So it's, but they're like, they're letting it happen. So then, you know, you can show these like scary images like on the TV screen, say, look what these people are doing. But it's, it, it's, you're, they're not the same group, but you're just juxtaposing two things and then making them an equivalent. It's 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 like it's all bullshit. Projects for a new American century, false flag terrorism controlling you mentally, the gospel in the hands of people with no empathy, a mixture of dangerous social chemistry between law enforcement and a military entity. Cameras on every corner, on every corner you facing, testing out a future Gestapo on immigration, power, consolidation, information restricted, just like the Iron law of oligarchy predicted incarcerating the poor among the drug addicted but not the families of the ruling class that's afflicted because it's a fucking caste system like corrupted Hinduism I think you should listen I've been through the system in prison I've been through religion I carried the cross as a Christian like it was anti disestablishment terrorism until the seeds of despotism arrested my vision lyricism with cynicism and syllogisms until they bethel Ali Sucampos and kill me in prison chemtrail conditions Stem cells of Leo Strauss's philosophy, the birth of neocon policy. But I laugh at America's fear of a new world order controlling the hemisphere. Cause our people been living that shit for the past 500 years. See you at 8 o'clock, motherfucker.